Welcome to Reading for Life. My name is Julie Kleinfelter, Director of the Public Library in Austin, Minnesota, and I'm here today with friends to wrap up the book, The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. The purpose of Reading for Life is to grow community around a shared love of literature. Real community begins and ends with our imaginations, and few resources are as vital to the imagination's development as works of literature. With me today is my co-host, Michael Verde, who founded Reading for Life in 2005. We're also joined today by several staff from Southeastern Libraries Cooperating, Steve Harson, Public Library Consultant, and Claire Hines, Legacy Coordinator. And Michael, we're going to let you start us off today. Well, how about we consider uh, the theme of one in the many? The, the one in the many in the history of philosophy has sort of been a recurrent kind of, well, concept that all philosophers in one way or another, or many philosophers, try to come to terms with because it seems to be a dynamic that is essential to our own identities. You can think of, for instance, I have many desires in one life. You can think of it at the social level. There's many people in this, uh, many diverse people in our society or community, and yet we have one community. And you can think of this even at the international level. We have many countries and yet one is humanity. How to integrate those two, let's say, units of identity is one of the essential challenges I'm going to suggest of every person, every community, and perhaps, you know, humanity as we know it, if not every species. This particular novel, obviously, given how clear the theme of opposites are, this novel really incisively engages with the question of how can we be one and many in such a way that the many are realized in the entirety of their uniqueness. In other words, the many participate in the one without compromising what it is that makes them an individual. And yet at the same time, there's something about the unity, the uh, coming together with other people that fulfills an individual in a way that his or her uniqueness in isolation of other people cannot. So that is kind of a, a let's just say, a framework. And I want to propose that we explore that in a contrast between the two religions that are contrasted in this novel, the religions of the Argorians, the religion of Argada, and the religion of Karhad or the Hondara. In, in some ways, religion is a quintessential uh, context in which the one and the many are, um, the, the dynamics between the one and the many are explored in a profound way. I mean, you can think, for instance, in, in, in Buddhism, the idea of getting out of oneself enables one to experience interdependence with other things. That's a reconciliation of the one and the many. You can think within Christianity, for instance, how it is that the nation of Israel becomes one people, or you can think of in the context of Christianity, how is it that you become part of the body of Christ? And even in the context of Islam, when you have Muslims that once a year uh, come together and walk around the Kaaba counterclockwise, all wearing the exact same color white outfit. And in that particular counterclockwise movement, there is no distinction in, between hierarchy. In other words, there is no one who has a grander status than another person in the context of that walk. These are all examples of, within religion of how the one and the many are, are the way the one and the many are reconciled in what's considered optimal ways. So that's uh, just where I thought we would start. And somebody you could take it even in a different direction entirely if that's, you know, if you're inclined to do, but I'm going to propose that we consider the contrast, particularly between Meshi, who is the, you could say the Yahweh or the God of the Ar Argorians, and Fax the Weaver, who plays, a, if, if not a God, he plays certainly a, a role of facilitation of community in a, a sort of religious context with the foretellers. So I'm going to propose that we just explore the contrast between those two ways of reconciling the one and the many. So we can I think of the two in the context of gender real quickly. I mean, you can think of, 
in the as a, as a gender how are we going to unite a family for instance and what's going to constitute the way we're unified in, in in this family if part of what is diverse about us is our sexuality or our gender for instance so anyway i just want to include that element in our conversation sorry julie that's okay I lost track of my thought, though. <laughs> oh, well, try to, wreck it, try to re resurrect it. Well, I do think that that's a, a valid thing to consider in regard to this book, and particularly in the sense that this book in many ways speaks to the whole topic of gender diversity that's very much before all of us today. And the, the many, the one, does somehow relate to that. I think in some ways this book is kind of clumsy in how it handles that in comparison to current dialogue um, here today that we use. And that brings up other questions about the book for me. How is it clumsy, do you think, like compared to now? Can you well, give an example? I feel like this book takes a very 1960s style of science fiction to the limits and where you use strange names, strange characters, made up places, everything is fantasy. We don't do that anymore in science fiction. Science fiction today, it, it's like pedestrian things with pedestrian names. And, and there's been a progression away from that model that everything had to be strange and made up and contrived and not like what we're like now and the alien was seen as different from us whereas now the alien sometimes is us and i think that that's a change and so i i feel like for our modern minds to me this book sometimes feels a little clumsy in how it handles that because it's so busy making the contrivances well that, that's um that's interesting. I don't know enough about science fiction genre, to, so I, I take your word for it. One thing I will say is that one of the observations that Ginley makes with regards to Estrogen is who was more alien to him, Estrogen or women? In other words, the alienness in that context had to do with a very local, very earthly very, uh, I would say, perennial issue with regards to men and women. So you could be right about the, the book's alienness. I would suggest that that alienness is in the service of bringing to our awareness how many things are alien to us in a very mundane way. In other words, what is it that we think of in a familiar way that is in fact alien? Or what is alien to us because we haven't hazard a kind of imaginative union that it would require for us not to be alien to one another. So anyway, that's what I want to say about that, that the alienness, you might be right, that it seems contrived at this point, I don't know. But the alienness in this novel, as the author's note makes clear, is entirely in the service of our own uh, life world and uh, of you could say the human species here on earth and not somewhere in Gethian or some other galaxy. So if the well, that example, that ac example actually really does, it, it, it kind of does illustrate what I'm trying to say. So in this book, there wasn't a foot, this concept that you could change from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. So she had to create these characters who had that ability inherent in them, which is really, strange and and different and whatnot today an 18 year old child can decide hey i'm really a woman and they can undertake the process to become a woman or the other direction to be a woman to become a man and so for us today that's a much more real thing we don't need to contrive a character that has inherent capabilities because we already have other kinds of things in mind for how that happens hmm. do we have people that can do kimmer do we have people that are both or could be both sex simultaneously, but then in a four or five day period go into something like estrosis or heat? 
I don't think so. So there's a sense in which uh, we, I don't think we would want to read this novel entirely within the frames of concepts that we consider the optimal evolution of spiritual consciousness. In other words, I don't think someone who identifies as they or them is identical to the people of Gethin. Yeah. I agree, but I don't think that's necessarily what Steve was trying to say. And I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Steve, but <laughs> um, now I'm thinking about genre and alienness and thinking about how, you know, yes, this is a product of its, you know, year, its decade. That is, this was the rise of that, of science fiction that was so out there and it had to distinguish itself that way. Um, but I also think that Le Guin uses that intentionally as a way to both introduce these ideas outside of the boundaries of human like our own preconceived notions of gender and everything like that, right? We are forced almost completely to leave behind Earth. You know, we don't have a Luke as a main character. There, She is cutting, you know, besides the fact that these characters, I think, essentially appear human, you know, they don't have eight arms and are purple and things like that. But beyond that, she is, I think, intentionally, you know, extrapolating this beyond our own imaginations, which in a way <laughs> makes me partially criticize the way the science fiction genre has gone. Um, and don't come for me. Uh, <laughs> I love science fiction, but I do think that the shift has been um less about making it more relatable and more about making it easier it's easier for people to read when and there's nothing wrong with being easy to read right being accessible is something really important you know these ideas need to be accessible but it makes us it it, it makes it easier and we don't have to think so hard you know, we don't have to put ourselves outside of our bodies, outside of our own experiences. We can sort of just, you know, read easy, read, read along. Um, and yeah, so I don't know where I'm going with this, but. Well, you're, you're on the right track from my perspective, Claire. None of us in this group is old enough to remember how straight jacketing the gender constructions were in the 50s and the 60s, the era that Le Guin was coming out of. Women couldn't buy a car. Mm -hmm. They couldn't take a loan. They couldn't, they couldn't do anything. Their role was to stay home and take care of the children. There, you, know, you had to be a pretty out there person to challenge the, that existing dichotomy of what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a man. The roles were just as constraining for men. And she's dealing with this, this very strict definition of what each one means. And she's trying to say, well, what if it was different? And, and so that's what this book is really examining is what were those social conventions and structures that were in place? And what if it was different? How could life be? But if she had tried to pose that, you know, idea using reality mm -hmm. it you know it, she never would have been able to do it that she would Correct. have attacked from every side and it would have flopped yeah one interesting thought that i had and i think that was uh interesting historically steve and i think really wonderful to consider a time period in which gender boundaries were far more um, policed so socially. What, what, what was going on internally, I'm sure people felt uh, the same degree of diversity of sexuality. I'm guessing that that was alive and well in the 60s or 70s or whenever, but the ability to 
recognize that socially, obviously, as you pointed out, was something that would come perhaps at, at a significant personal cost to somebody. But in any case, one question that I'm asking myself is, during the period that you described, I think, so well that we can think of maybe as the Beaver Cleaver period or whatever, I don't want to be unfair to that sitcom, what was the mythology that legitimized those rigid gender binaries and limits of uh, self-expression. In other words, what when these people in the 50s and 60s that we're describing, and they're all they're alive and well today, when those folks are going to church and interacting with what they imagine to be the source of their divine existence, what kind of God is it that they had in mind? And that I think is going to bring us back to the religion of the Orgata and the Handara, because both of these societies that are animated in the novel have mythologies that inform their imaginations. And we too have mythologies that inform our imagination. In that sense, the book is contemporary as any work of fiction always is. Otherwise, we couldn't identify with Shakespeare or Chaucer, etc. So what we could ask ourselves, when people during this period with rigid binaries were going to interact with their ultimate idea of the source of their own being, how did they imagine that God? And I'm going to propose that there would be something like Meshi that would have imaginatively underwritten the social world that you described so well, Steve. And I think that that is a powerful critique of that time period. In other words, uh, you could say Le Guin's imagination was going so deep into those social uh, norms that she was making visible the entire reading, you could say, of Christianity that was legitimating a man's dominion over a woman. You, In other words, I think she's going to the heart of the illness, the social malaise that you described so well. Hmm. That a God of that period, for many people, would have been Meshi. And I think in this particular novel, Meshi is as close as you could get to Satan or the absolute contrary of life. That, and I agree, Claire, I think if you were to come out and say, you know, you guys, your God is a perverted distortion of what you think of as God. In fact, the God that you worship on Sunday is a direct contradiction to Jesus, who seems to me more like facts the weaver. I mean, Jesus, who was going to the people who were rejected according to those binary codes, the people who were impure according to those binary codes, this, at least mythologically, was the community that Jesus reached out to and that subsequently cost him his life because he was crossing those kinds of boundaries. So I, I would say, if you wanted to say how big a critique this was, you could, it, what I'm saying you could imagine someone saying, you know, the God you worship on Sunday in Jesus's name is the absolute contrary of the Jesus character as it's revealed in scripture and that your God is really a devil. That would be quite a critique. And yet I think it's implicit in this novel. I think that for a lot of people, it would be quite a critique today, even though it still holds. If if anything, it you know it it's even more relevant in some ways. Um, so, yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't. I mean, of course, there's religious allegory in this book, but I don't think I had drawn those connections. And I would be really fascinated to talk to someone who did read this in the '60s. And what they thought. And if it was just a goofy, quirky sci-fi book to them, which I'm sure it was to many people, or, you know, did people make those connections? And well, I'm sure they did, but but how many and were there conversations about it? Um would be would be very interesting. I don't think there's much of an understanding of the potential social impact that this book had or could have had and can still have today. I think that was one of go ahead, go ahead Julia. I was just gonna say I think that was <laughs> the one in the many. 
The one Steve, in the Manny. You go, Steve. I was going to say that I'm pretty sure that there was a, a group of intelligentsia who did read this book and who did look at it that way. And, you know, we might find some kind of a, of an analysis of the book or something that was written in something like, say, The New Yorker or maybe The Atlantic from those years if we went and looked for it. Absolutely. There would be research articles and also, like you said, popular. Uh, and, well, and partly because, as we said before, Le Guin's parents were the Krobers, who were the anthropologist thinking elite kind of people, and they had connections. She knew people who were part of that intelligentsia who would read her work absolutely. and understand it from that perspective. So there's probably something written somewhere. No doubt about it, because they would just had cr critics that lived at that time period, and they would have addressed the, the novel. This reminds me, speaking of going back in time to how novels are uh, the reaction in a particular historical and social context, I'm thinking of the reaction to Jane Eyre, which interestingly was not written under Charlotte Bronte's name, but the name of Kerr or Bell for, all, for many of the reasons that we're talking about now, uh, which was interesting because people did not know if the author was a man or a woman. Uh, so here is how one reviewer dealt with that question mark. The reviewer, a male, said, if a man wrote this, it's a work of genius. If a woman wrote this, it's diabolical. And that is a, a, a quote that you could resurrect from history, uh, which is one indication of how explosive something could be in real time. If people, because Jane Eyre, of course, is written in such a way that you could make direct connections between Lowood, for instance, and the school uh, which it was uh, inspired it, people were be reading the novel thinking this is hitting pretty close to home, which may have uh, inspired that one reviewer's response. That is, that, I think we got in, we've talked ourselves into a very interesting PhD topic, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> And we, we should all, speaking of the one and many, go in together and get a collective PhD and make sense of it. But this is a really, really interesting to think about how audiences uh, at the time, let's say a publication, respond versus how audiences respond later and what that reveals about both social and historical context. I think that's really interesting. I think one of the reasons why I thought this was going to be such an interesting book for us to talk about is that idea of that it's, you know, what is it, 40 years later, this book is still, you know, as a society, we're still dealing with the same things. And, you know, you'd like to think that another 40 years from now that maybe we won't be, but I don't know, maybe it's kind of that universal, you know, mortal issue of, you know, between the binaries and the hierarchies and, you know, how do we work through those things? And, or is it just kind of this cycle of, you know, this kind of an endless cycle, which to me is a little depressing. Um, but, but still we have made progress. I think like you guys talked about, I don't think that Le Guin's characters doesn't really take on the um, or at the time, kind of, you know, the they, thems, and where do they, where would they fit in to that society? And um, because it is, the book is such a, it is such a binary. It really is only the male or the female. And then that kind of in-between. But, but the in-between is not really an in-between. It's almost something different. And I well, think. That's, yeah, that's interesting to think of what reconciliation, what would the in-between be like? Is right. it a melding like we've turned into tapioca pudding, which right. would be one way to reconcile the one and the many, the many could all become one. right? Or could the many become one in a way that was actually enhanced the many? Right. And, and I think the novel puts this <laughs> into the terms of the body politic versus the body mystic. And another way I think to think of this is that I can't pronounce the name Shifkathor, or mm -hmm. essentially a way of speaking in Gethian, in which one person tries to one up the other person. So you could think of Shifkathor versus mind speech, and would it be possible for the one and the many to unite in a way that was mutually and communally enriching, if everyone speaks Shifkathor 
In other words, I suppose you're not going to. And learning how to not speak shifketer is, I think, one of the things that generally I uh, learns in this novel. In other words, if we're ever going to not do this depressing thing of going around and around these same collisions, it's going to have something to do with us learning how to communicate in another way and communicate in a way in which the left or darkness are not equated with perversion or with something that is uh, less than holy. In other words, we would have to unite these opposites, these what Jung might call our shadow, uh, the, the things that inside of us that are also binarily hierarchically reconciled. We would never, in other words, be able to become a community in a mutually beneficial way socially if we're not achieving something like that imaginatively with regards to our own bodies. So all that to say, learning how to speak mind speech, I sus I'm going to propose, is one of the things that are at stake in this novel. And specifically, are we able to enter into imaginative conversation with this novel with something like mind speech, or do we enter into imaginative conversation with it with something like Schiffgather? And that might be parallel to, do we engage with it with our imagination or do we engage with it with our ego? These are things I think are all implicit in the reader's response to the novel, which the author's note makes very clear that the Le Guin was very aware. What does she say? There are many voices in many different genres but one novel. Mm -hmm. And if you don't read it as one novel, you will have missed something that I'm telling you is the fact. So mm -hmm. again, there's the one in the, in a many in a very interesting context. Any case, uh, I'm, I'm proposing that if we're ever going to have a community in which each individual person is fulfilled in a way that he or she would not be alone, that it's going to have something to do with learning how to communicate in a way other than what shift uh, symbolizes. I think that's, it's interesting because I think, you know, I think that's one of the things that I like about science fiction and fantasy is that for me, I think I can get there easier when I'm dealing with something that is so different from my reality. Um, but I think what I've experienced in some of our conversations with this reading for life group is I'm seeing that in classics like Jane Eyre, where here's, you know, it, that's not a world that I live in necessarily either, but it's more familiar in some ways than, you know, a completely different planet and a completely alien people. Um, so I think that's kind of really interesting. I, it, I think it's definitely what I love about literature, right, is that trying to learn how to communicate with someone who's different than you through the book. And certainly the novels engage with that, right? Isn't generally I uh, an alien mm -hmm. uh, in, on this planet? So in other words, the theme of alien and exile, which seem to be overlapping, is a inter integral theme of the novel itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm proposing we can imagine that the alien, that there's things that are alien to us now that we're not imagining as alien and because we're not imagining it as alien, we're not entering into it in a way that our differences matter. One of the things that generally I discovers with Esterban is that the bond between them was predicated on their differences, that the differences was the bridge between them. Now, think of what's at stake in that imaginatively. In other words, you would have to recognize that there is something in the other that's alien if you're going to love the other at all. And if I don't recognize the alien in the other, then I'm denying the difference that enables us to bond in a way that's mutually fulfilling. So whatever, however the genre of science fiction has changed or not changed, I don't know. But this novel's profundity in almost a prophetic way uh, inclines me to think that it is as relevant in this instance as it was in the instance of its public publication, because it's addressing things that are far deeper than what is typically bannered about 
in public forums, when you get two people on TV to argue different points, at one level, they're both speaking shipgather. At one level, they're reinforcing what is what is one of the parts of this novel that learns from facts the weaver. If you deny something, you're also affirming it. The, the, the way to grow out of binaries is to grow out of them entirely. You can't defeat a binary with another binary. So I would say that most of our discourse is at a superficial level that is based on Schiffgather and that what literature offers us is a school in which we can learn mind speech and that mind speech involves relating to language in very different ways than Schiffgather. That people who speak Schiffgather have a God like Meshi and people who speak mind, sheath, mind speech have something more like an experience that facts the weaver facilitates. Interesting. Claire, so, any I, other thoughts there? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, that's all well and good. How do we translate that into action? You know, in a society that is growing more and more, you know, people are growing apart. Loneliness is an epidemic. Um, and when people do come together, it's often in groups of like-minded people more and more. Um, we're no longer put into situations where we have to work and converse and get along with people who don't think the same way we do. And so how do we create those opportunities? How do we translate the very alien concepts in this book to actual actions in our communities? I love the question. I also ask it. So <laughs> I think it's a wonderful question. Uh, one, think... one proposal is that we're at least attempting it right now in this conversation. Yeah, I think I think part of the answer is the first thing is being aware, you know, being aware that you're surrounding yourself by people who are just like you and and understanding that that there may be a different way, that maybe that's not the best way. Um, I think I it's interesting. I've been I was in a couple meetings this morning where we talk a lot about the diversity in this town and and um, and the 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 ways that that makes this a good town and how many of us stayed here not intending to stay here because of that difference and that diversity and what that brings to the community so I think sometimes that is I think you're right Claire I think it's like the dark side of social media like you can really get yourself into a um, into a space on your social media where you're only hearing your own voice echoed back to you but it also has gives you the capability to reach out to people who are very different from you who you may not who may not live in your town if you don't live in a diverse, you know, place and, and it gives you that opportunity, but you have to be aware that that's something that is important. And yeah, so, yeah you have I to think fight the algorithm. <laughs> you, you do. Absolutely. That is trying to silo you into your, you know, all your niches, the things that make you comfortable. And right. I think that libraries have such a unique opportunity to facilitate these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, we often talk about the library as the third place and what does that mean? And um, are there other organizations in our communities that are really set up to do this quite as well as library? I would argue no. And what does that mean with libraries of course, I'm a little biased, but <laughs> with libraries on the, you know, being defunded and closing and things like that, because they're undervalued and, you know, only seen through this traditional lens. And really politically being under attack at this yes. time and place right now, too. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting. Imagine if Teeb, who was the person, the prime minister after Esterman, imagine if Teeb was the prime minister now, I'm guessing that as part of his campaign, uh, he would have wanted to defund libraries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there, I love there, that, Claire. I love the vision, the library yeah. as a place where we can attempt mind speech. We mm -hmm. could attempt recognizing the alien. We could attempt something that perhaps no other form, including church, uh, it, has the guts or the capacity or the discourse or the mythology 
uh, to enable that kind of conversation. So I do think that's wonderful. In, in terms of action steps, I think young people and old people learning how to read in a way that's not shifkether would be a practical action step. And in, in other words, I don't know that we're going to achieve the kind of unity that we're imagining is optimal if our imaginations aren't educated. And I don't imagine they're going to spontaneously be educated. So I'm I'm cheering on the idea of library as a third space where we can learn how to at least hazard the challenge of mind speech. All right. That's well, we've talked ourselves into a lather, we uh, which is always satisfying. Uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, just just their interest in even risking a conversation like this. This is kind of this fun. I don't have a lot of these conversations during the day, and I want to thank the imagination of Ursula Gwynn for making it possible for us to have this kind of conversation. And I want to thank Austin, Minnesota Public Library for making it possible for us to have this kind of conversation as well, and for uh, the local PBS aff affiliation for making this conversation publicly available to people. That does speak something about your community that I do think is special and, and observes uh, applause. Okay. Thank you. Until next time. Until next time. See you later, guys. Reading for Life.